I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Oscar Martin, a strategy, innovation, and transformation executive with GKN Aerospace. Oscar's extensive career experience includes executive and technical expertise with cutting-edge technology firms, including BRS Aerospace, the AKO Group, Aero Engineering, Adeco Technologies, Hewlett Packard, and his current role with GKN Aerospace. Our focus today are large-scale trends in aerospace and their potential impact on society. So, Oscar, welcome, sir. We have known each other now for about four years. So, in terms of the aerospace sector, you're one of the top influencers that I follow, and so I'm really pleased to be able to share your thoughts with the audience. Let me start out by asking about your background and how you've seen the industry change over the course of your career. Well, uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, it's a pleasure being here with you today. Uh, well, I, I started uh, long ago, about 20 years ago in, in the aerospace industry. I, I'm an electrical engineer. Uh, and 20 years ago, I decided to learn how to fly. Uh, I purchased my aircraft and I learned. And since then, I, I've been in love with uh, aviation, space, and everything related. I, I learned very close to, to, to the Johnson Space Center. Uh, so uh, I, I, uh, th that kicked off, kicked off my, my passion on space also. So. Uh, and since then, I've been involved in, in many projects. Uh, I, I've been the, the director of two subsystems for the Galileo satellites. Uh, and, and I've been also related with uh, other uh, space ventures, uh, and, um, jet engines, and in general manufacturing. I've been also uh, with AKO Group in the energy industry, generating, I mean, uh, manufacturing, designing and manufacturing control systems for chemical and, and power plants, nuclear, CSP. And well, uh, I'm now, uh, other than what I do now, I'm supporting uh, companies in their challenges, startups, helping startups on growing up and, and helping other companies to improve their, their processes. Mm, okay. And anyway, I, I, I've always wanted to be in contact with technology, so that's why uh, I, I don't want to get too far from, from technology. I love both things, business and, and technology, and I'm really, really happy to be uh, where I am right now. Well, and you have an amazing eye for upcoming technologies and upcoming trends, and that's actually across a wide scope of technologies. Aerospace was a difficult choice for today because you post on so many different things. But you know, when I was when I was looking at things before the interview, I was like, okay, what should we focus on? And I was like, aerospace has a lot going on in it right now. There's there's too much really in tech to cover, I guess, as mega trends. So I thought, let's focus on aerospace today. Um, so what are some of the most exciting things that are currently happening in the aerospace industry? And where do you see the industry going in the near future? Well, aerospace, uh, aviation space is going through a huge transformation. They are melting together and along with other areas of technology, such as uh, um, artificial intelligence and, and communication is, 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 is going to change a lot, a lot. Uh, from the point of view of everyday aviation, uh, we, we are facing out, I mean, the technology is uh, trying to face out fossil fuels. So, uh, and, and hydrogen seems to be one alternative. Uh, sustained aviation fuels should be the other one. Uh, and we don't have a clear idea of what's going to be the future at this point. So it's going to be like the VHS and beta <laughs> at some point in the past. So uh, we're, we're going through the same kind of exploration. Uh, and well, same for cars. We don't really know what's going to be the future. It's clearly electric, but we don't know yet what's going to be the winning technology. Um, and, and in aviation, we, we're going also through the other revolution, which is automation. And Airbus is exploring 
uh, systems to remove pilots from, from the cabin and uh, for, for safer flight. And um, uh, the other is in the defense area where artificial intelligence will most probably take over uh, fighters and guidance systems and even taking decisions at uh, battle stage level. So we are going through a lot of transformation in, in aviation uh, for long haul. It seems that it's going to be very difficult to have a clean and fast uh, long haul aviation and with the claims from SpaceX that they could be doing point-to-point -point transportation with 10 millions per flight it seems to be pretty much at the level of current long-haul aviation so the the future it's going to be very interesting and it's going to change a lot yeah and well uh probably by 2050 we will see uh kind of uh, starships uh, point to point transportation for continent to continent, moving people within the hour from LA to London or from London to Tokyo. Well, and that's that's a new trend actually. And I didn't put that in the questions, but yeah. I just read about that. So that, and I believe that is something that the defense department has looked at also for moving critical you know, infrastructure, critical pieces. But th th this idea of it's literally a rocket ship, right? It's the Elon Musk starship and it lifts off on one part of the earth and then lands on another. And for me, that was kind of mind blowing. I'm like, okay, you would take a rocket and it's point to point on the earth though for a rocket. It goes into space and then lands somewhere else. So, but the speed is what makes it useful, right? Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so you you just ran down a lot of the stuff on my questions. Let me drill down a little bit. Yeah. So there's okay. innovation in drones and UAVs. That's been a really hot topic. It's been in the headlines a lot for the last few years. Do you see these as systems, do you see them evolving into these airborne package delivery systems that Jeff Bezos talked about? Should we expect any surprises in this area? Well, it, it all depends on the cost. Uh, because right now i think that the legal framework is going in the right direction uh and faa is defining a, a, a new uh airspace below 400 feet that could uh, very well serve for that purpose and um uh, it seems that amazon is now uh delivering some very interesting uh product i mean the the, the drones that to, to deliver uh packages that you know the last mile uh and and that seems really promising uh because at, at least here in the us where most people living in in single family homes with backyards or front yards where um or driveways that where where drones can can deploy the uh, the the packet the packets, so uh, I, I see a future here in the U.S. I have my concerns in other areas of uh, of the world, such as Asia or or Europe, where most people live in condos. But even even in that situation, uh. There will always be a way to leave it on the roof or to prepare some uh, pickup places, and that will help on on many areas. It will help on uh, sustainable downtowns where we can remove the the cars from from there. It's a common thing in Europe. You can see a lot of downtown areas in in Europe without uh, without any traffic at all. And people still live there, so uh, so that could help uh, elderly and, and people to 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 receive goods and support and uh, everything uh, from the air. So I think that we are at the very very beginning of 
of this path. And there is a lot of future for drone delivery. Yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting. You know, I, I was in telco many years ago, and the big challenge was always that last mile, right? And that's what drone delivery reminds me of. It's the last mile. You know, you've got this hub and spoke distribution network for packages. And, you know, you can get it close, but then it's just getting it there, right? And, it, you know, right now we're using trucks and, you know, the post office and stuff like that. And so, so drones are intriguing because of that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, now, so in terms of military applications, the Predator and Reaper drones used by the military, the, they, they seem like a proof of concept for UAVs, right? So we're, we're taking things up a little bit in scale. Now, those are remotely piloted, but would you call those programs a success? And do you think that future programs like that are going to be influenced by those? Well, uh, they they were very successful uh, for 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 many years, and they've proved that the drones uh, are here to stay, to stay, and probably to replace uh, other <laughs> other roles in 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 crewed uh, aircraft. But um, but obviously. Uh, the future is not exactly those products and the, the Pentagon knows it very well and that's why they are now searching for something else. Why? Because till today, uh, most of the uh, warfare was aimed at uh, playing a role in Middle East and uh, on, on land. But the future seems to be uh, mostly uh, played in the Pacific. <laughs> you know, the South China Sea is now becoming one of the uh, uh, focus of the uh, military uh, future. And uh, uh, in, in those areas, Reaper doesn't have the, the, the capabilities. Uh, range, speed is limited for, for those uh, aircraft. And uh, the, the, the future is going to be focusing on stealth drones, faster drones, and uh, with, with more uh, offense capability. Now, do you think we'll see swarms as well? Yeah, swarms is, is the future. Actually, I, I believe that there are three programs right now uh, that the Pentagon is seeding with a lot of money. Uh, one is the ACE uh, that aims at uh, add artificial intelligence capability to, to drones so they could successfully uh, be superior in, in a dogfight mm. with other aircrafts. And the AC program already demonstrated that uh, in simulations that uh, an artificial intelligence is superior to the best pilots that we have. So th that's a scary, but it's the future. And I, I remember a, a, a movie from the early 2000 called uh, Stealth that reflects what could be the risks of those uh, technologies, also the capabilities, because really superior and and they can coordinate very quickly. Uh, so that, that's one of the technologies. The other is uh, Skyborg, which is exactly that, is how we can create uh, autonomous system that could take quick decisions and decide on targets on when to fire and the, the I mean the, the humans will just select the target and the system would decide how when and 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 well and the weapons to to, to destroy the, the target so that that's the the second technology. And, and the third is the Gremlins project. That is really, really awesome. Is 
how to deploy uh, inexpensive drones from two to eight million dollars from aircraft to near, I mean, in, in safe, but near the contested area. Then they do whatever mission they, they are tasked to. Then they return and they dock again on air. Mm. So it's a kind of the concept of mothership, but instead of being an aircraft carrier on, on the sea, having a, a fleet of them flying. The test bed is now working. I mean, we were using C-130s as those uh, mothership, but they could be very well adapted to C-17s, C-5s, or, or even B-52 to be the, the, those, those motherships. And each one can deploy, imagine, 20, 30 uh, fighters. Those fighters are autonomous and they could be as deadly as an F-35, but with higher maneuverability because, we, because uh, without the, the limiting factor of the pilot, uh, autonomous aircraft can have uh, more maneuverability than, than, than uh, crewed aircraft. And they could carry the same amount of, of payload. Uh, why? Are they so inexpensive? Well, they don't need to have all the cabin, all the human safety systems, all the instrumentation in, in, the, in the cockpit. They don't need landing gear because they don't need to land. They don't need large wings because they won't be ever uh, flying at low speed. They don't need to land. They don't need to take off. Everything is uh, on air. Yeah. They, they don't need a large fuel tank because they don't need to take off because they are air deployed. So, uh, and one third of the fuel is used to, to take off and, and getting closer to, to, the, to the area. So they, they will have uh, less need, less, less fuel, so less weight. Uh, if you remove the flaps because at high speed you don't need flaps, uh less control areas less uh, no landing gear uh, uh, uh smaller wings then it's a lot lighter and being lighter means that it requires a, a less powerful engine smaller engine cheaper well inexpensive engine so it could carry the same thing as an f-35 but probably at a third or a fourth of the weight yeah. And cost, a lot less cost, because one of these systems can cost about $8 million instead of $80 million. So you could, uh, you could deploy 10 of them for the same cost. Uh, and if anyone gets shut down, well, it's only one tenth of the cost and, no, uh, and, and without risking any life. So uh, the, the future is clearly uh, in that direction. Um, with the current um, hypersonic weapons that have been developed by China and, and Russia, uh, an aircraft carrier is a sitting duck <laughs> in the middle of the ocean. So uh, this new system would allow us to, to have a quick offensive uh power that could be flexible and be deployed in a matter of two or three hours from hawaii or uh, the, the alaska or the pacific coast of the us very quickly and uh with a very flexible attributable units yeah so 
Yeah, that's the, the, the remarkable power of automation. Well, let, let's come back from defense stuff for a moment. I, I want to touch on electric air taxis. This is also something that's been making a lot of headlines. These are being designed in a lot of form factors. I've seen things that look almost like a conventional aircraft, and then I've seen some that are completely VTOL based. But I, I, I'm really interested in this VTOL electric approach. I saw one a while ago. It was called the E Hang, and it, you know the it, the engines kind of hung overhead, and it was a single passenger commuter. Uh, it was a Chinese company that made it for basically uh, point to point in the city, right? To basically get over traffic. It only had like a 30 minute flight time. But I saw that and this was, I think that's about three or four years old now. And I, I was like, yes, I want one of those. Um, do you see electric BTOL systems catching on for urban commuter transport? Maybe, maybe even giving the average commuter almost helicopter-like access that only CEOs could afford in the past? Well, we've, we've all uh, dreamed about having a future for decades, <laughs> a Jetson's future where you can take your car and fly it wherever you want to go in a straight line and, and without the problem of ground traffic, because obviously uh, the airspace is 3D and ground is only one layer. So uh, it, it offers more uh, uh, room for more traffic. But the current trend uh, uh, of the advanced uh, air management is to treat airspace as traditional airspace. So you, you take your flight path and that air path is reserved for you, only for you. Uh, that makes it more complicated because the 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 density is going to be limited but it's a first step i mean we can we, we it, it's a first step if we keep improving it uh if we are uh if we use it and we take that temporary solution as permanent that's the danger of this then it won't solve anything because we already have a VDOL solution. We have helicopters that basically they are the same. The only problem is noise and 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 that they are not green at all, <laughs> burning uh, gas. But uh, uh, VDOLs try to solve electric VDOL try to solve noise pollution and they are trying to solve the cost problem. And that's the, the, the main problem, cost. So uh, manufacturers, they are now developing a, a plethora of different solutions, fixed wings, uh, moving wings, tilting wings, uh, open, uh, open rotor uh, with nacelles uh, like Lilium. Uh, I mean, different solutions that shows that the industry is not, sorry, oh, that, the, that the industry uh, is not mature enough. Yeah, well, and, and electric, I think, is, is one of the big keys, right? And the entire industry is looking at electric. I've even seen um, electric passenger jet concepts, you know, like 747 size. I mean, we're, we're talking giant aircraft and and uh the the concept they were looking at okay how could we make this electric in nature and then you mentioned hydrogen fuel just as kind of an alternative a while ago so do you think everything is going to push that direction well hydrogen is an alternative uh is is uh, the, the the biggest problem of hydrogen is the the efficiency uh but other than that it, it's a uh, it, it's uh, clear, it offers a solution to, to the uh, range problem, uh, also for cars, not only for, for aircrafts, but given the amount of energy required and the, the weight of the batteries that has not evolved as we all are expecting, uh, hydrogen is, is gaining a lot of momentum. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. hopefully, hopefully batteries will take a jump. That's an area that I've covered elsewhere. And the, <laughs> there, yeah, there are some things coming, right? But who knows how long it'll take so yeah solid batteries can improve some problems of current lithium batteries but they don't fix the weight problem that is for aviation is the biggest problem uh, but yes there are uh, some batteries technologies that hopefully could be scaled up to to industrial level that could solve this this problem uh, the problem with, with lithium batteries, lithium ion batteries. Uh, in hydrogen, we have fuel cells technologies that are improving uh, high temperature. Uh, fuel cells uh, are way more efficient than traditional hydrogen BM uh, solutions. The, there is a, uh, the, there are a couple of, of manufacturers that are evolving that technology and they are making it very lightweight that in addition to, to try to use uh, liquid hydrogen or even solid hydrogen in the far future, maybe. <laughs> yeah, crystal, crystal hydrogen that keeps solid at room temperature. That mm. could be, uh, and, and it's very dense in the energy. It's really, really dense. That would be a, a, a solution. That would be amazing. That would be amazing. So that kind would of a be solid really, really amazing. Uh, but yes, hydrogen is an alternative. Is a, a, a feasible alternative. Even Airbus is considering hydrogen for long haul aviation. And uh, I, I made a, a, an article, a study uh, long ago, probably three years ago, about that, and it's feasible. Uh, I mean, if we take uh, hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, and we use it to keep uh, superconducting motors, electric motors, cold enough at about 77, not, not that cold, at 77, minus 77 could be um, enough to, to, to make them superconducting. So they could be very, very light. They could be small and light, but that's the problem of electric motors. Electric motors cannot evolve uh, scale up in, in, in power while keeping the same power to weight ratio. I mean, mm. the, the larger okay. they are, uh, you can make them twice as powerful, but then the weight is a lot more than, than twice. I see what you mean, yeah. So uh, the, the performance of small rotors that you can have about uh, 20 kilograms per kilowatt uh, then um, that that goes. I mean, twenty. Sorry, the opposite. Twenty kilowatts per kilogram with the small rotors in large is impossible. It's very difficult to reach even nine. So that that's one of the problems. If we go to superconducting, we we it could be almost linear. So that's great. That's yeah. Great. And so that's another role for hydrogen. That's another role for, for liquid hydrogen that could be cooling. And then we will be able to use superconducting motors that are very light. So if we use light fuel, like uh, hydrogen, light generator fuel cells, and light motors, then aviation could be really, really light, even lighter than what it is today for the, yeah. for the power systems. So it could allow more payload. And, and that's great because that, that will bring down the cost because you can put more goods on it. So the, the numbers favor uh, those solutions that are lighter. And that's why uh, electrical uh, uh, VTOLs are not yet outside because the, the, the cost factor is not completely solved <laughs> yeah and that's why the, the the motor problem is why we don't see electric helicopters because a helicopter helicopters has a, a single rotor with a powerful engine and we won't have powerful uh, a single rotor uh, powered by a single electric motor because that motor would be massive 
So it, so it sounds like in terms of electric vehicles, then we're probably in the to be continued category where we're waiting on a lot of things. Superconductors, probably, probably part of that. But now, now let me let me move uh, beyond aircraft for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, I, I, I want to get into AI in spacecraft and actually robotic space. I mean, probes, satellites, things like that. That's that's old news. But there, there is a lot going on there. Um, one of the things that was really interesting to me was this X-37B space plane. I'm sure you've, you've, you're familiar with that. That's, uh, it's, it's an unmanned, automated space shuttle, right? And again, yeah. I, the, when I first learned about that, I saw this little you know, tiny thing. And I said, well, where's the pilot? And they're like, no, it's robotic. Oh, that's amazing. So, so you know what, when you think about it, I mean, this is like, what, 40, 50 years ago when the space shuttle was flying, right? It's this enormous beast. It's got like a, what, seven person crew or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, in the space of that time, now we have one that is completely computer controlled, the, you know, and it's, it's tiny, but it doesn't have to be large because they're only doing small test payloads with it. So, I mean, that's one example. Another it, and again, just absolutely brilliant for me is are, are, are these self-landing boosters that SpaceX uses, right? I think everyone has been so impressed. And when I saw that, I was just like, that's genius. How did they make that work? So uh, I, I know AI is playing a large role in aircraft. Do you think that we'll see it play a larger and larger role in space as well? It is already. Uh, I mean, artificial intelligence is used in, in, in space for guidance, for, uh, for many other systems, uh, but probably not as wild <laughs> as it is right now in, in the aviation industry. Uh, regarding landings, uh, actually, um, SpaceX wasn't the first one. Uh, actually, the, the record of landing rockets uh, is Masten. Masten did it er earlier than 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 SpaceX, and they've they've had more than six hundred rocket landings, mm. and they, they have uh, many reusable uh, landers. Uh, they are not in the launch industry, but they did it. Um, very often, and they they are the test bed of NASA for that. Uh, actually, the 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 terrain navigation system that was used on Mars to land the Perseverance was tested uh, before by them by by Masten, and SpaceX actually took the the idea uh, of landing to to be able to recover them. Uh, there are. Uh, th that's the future, obviously. Reusability is, is obvious. I mean, single-use rockets is like, <laughs> imagine if we had to, to do sing single-use aircraft, <laughs> the, the cost of, of travel would be impossible. So it's, it's the obvious way. Uh, here, yeah, I, I, it's, it's impressive. Uh, and I remember the first landing of, of the two boosters of the uh, Falcon Heavy was amazing, uh, really, really. What, what do you think SpaceX would be able to keep up the pace? I mean, they have really been leading the industry, you know? Do, do you think that they'll be able to kind of stay out there in front? Those boosters, yeah, for me, that was, I think that was a pivotal moment for everyone. When they both touched down, it was the same time, it was all computer controlled, you know? Do, do you think they'll be able to keep pulling off big scores like that? Well, uh, I think that their problem is is exactly that: is capacity. They have more demand than than the possible supplies. It's like electric cars. Right now, there is more. There are always being more demand than than offer. You know, and, and Tesla is not struggling in <laughs> selling their cars. They are struggling in manufacturing <laughs> the cars. So, so in space, we are more or less in the same situation. We have now a, a long wait list. Uh, and companies, they, they are, I think there are almost 200 uh, companies, right? Startups trying to, to supply services because uh, not everyone will need, uh, will be able to use the, uh, the ride share uh, on a large bus because they, they want a specific orbits that they cannot be deployed massively with, with, with a space tag. Uh, 
in, in that sense, I see uh, more, uh, I see a lot of future, not just in sending things to space, but also you, using the, the, strat the stratosphere to I mean, go into space, but not at orbital speeds to reach one point to the other, point to point transportation, because that requires a lot less uh, fuel than going to orbit. About twenty percent less fuel than than going to orbit because you are almost there, but you are not at that at, at the speed. I mean, if, if reaching orbit, uh, some people think that it's just getting there. It's not getting there. It's getting there at and and at certain speed. Yeah, at, at, at an orbital velocity. Yeah, at orbital velocity because you can reach orbital altitude with a small rocket the same way uh blue origin does that with with the rockets it's a small single engine and they reach the space and goes down but but it's a ballistic trajectory it's not orbital speed that's why it's so small and 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 that is the actual transformative uh technology that we will see, I hope we will see, but for sure our kids and our grandchildren will, will, will see, uh, will use like we use today aircraft. It's gonna be a wild ride because taking off is, uh, it's a, a lot of Gs. It's like riding a, a roller coaster, and then uh, almost uh, zero G, and then the descent, well, it's not going to be that bad. It's not like the, the takeoff. But yeah, yeah it's uh, point to point. It's going to be traveling from LA to London or from New York to Sydney. It's going to be like uh, a long roller coaster, basically. Well, and, and you know, that's so that's not in my questions. And this is something I am a little bit familiar with. But you're right now you're blowing my mind. And, and so let me just key in on that with the audience. You're talking about point to point commuter rocket transport. And yeah. again, the DOD looked at this for moving critical supplies and, and infrastructure components. I know this is something they looked at, right? Like you have a, a Lord only knows a special satellite dish that has to match with another piece. You have to get it across the earth in 10 minutes. Okay, we'll put it on a rocket. And, and I thought, well, that's incredibly expensive, but I, I guess I could see them doing that. You know, they like to burn money. They like to burn rockets. Okay, that that's them. But, but you're actually talking about commuter rocket transport. So that that would be, um, again, that's mind blowing. Did, now, do you think the cost could come down enough? And, and do you think with that kind of volume, would, would pollution become a major environmental concern? Well, uh, let, 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 the first question is the cost. I'm sure that the cost is gonna come down. I mean, right now, uh, manufacturing and rocket engines is expensive just because we manufacture them uh, in a very small number. As soon as we could manufacture them in higher quantities, the, the cost is going to come down and the quality is going to go up because we will have more data from the supply chain to, to increase the quality of those units. You know, if you, if you manufacture three, four, five, you don't know uh, the, the variability, if it's affecting, if it's not affecting, because you don't have enough uh, samples, data samples to, 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 va to validate or not, or to, to estimate the quality of your production system. But as long as you grow the, the, the numbers of units, you can, you can increase a lot the quality and you can increase and you can decrease a lot the cost per unit because you can use uh, uh, aut automation that for small number of units there is no sense of using automation 3d printing has been a, a technology that has reduced a lot the cost of manufacturing of uh, rocket engines so if you put all that together 
uh, I'm pretty sure that the, reli the reliability is going to go up, cost is going to come down, quantity is going to go up. So uh, I'm sure that what Elon Musk says about having a flight for $10 million each is possible. It's yeah. possible. Probably not at the beginning, but within the decade, I'm sure that we will reach those levels. You know, it's like aviation. Uh, the, the, you know, from the first jet aircraft in the late 40s to a jet airliner was 10 years, 10, 15 years. That is what it's going to take us from the first starship to the uh, commuting starship. Well, not commuting, but yeah, probably once a week or, or so coming, going from LA to London back. And, and that's going to be the beginning, uh, I'm sure. Regarding pollution, well, that, it all depends on the technology that, that they use. Uh, for instance, uh, Blue Origin is fully green because they burn hydrogen. Hydrogen with oxygen is water. So the byproduct of, of that engine is water. It's, it's like a fuel cell vehicle. <laughs> Uh, that there are some byproducts, but in a rocket, I mean, if, if in aviation, if we burn hydrogen with air, we generate uh, 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 ox uh, nitrogen uh, uh, ox oxygen. Oh, nitrous oxides, yeah. Yeah, nit nit but it's NO1 or NO2, I mean, different compost, uh, uh, different molecules that are uh that is pollution uh so but that doesn't happen in a rocket because you have pure oxygen and pure hydrogen so that the byproduct is pure water so it's fully clean at least the 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 new shepherd is a clean rocket uh, the new breed of of engines they all used methane uh, the, the, the new engines that Blue Origin uh, is going to be using in the new Glenn rocket or ULA, the same one that are going to be using the, in the new ULA Vulcan or, what, uh, or, or the new Raptor engines that are going to be used uh, in, in, the, um, uh, in the Starship that SpaceX are, are going to be using or even the future that probably Aryan space uh, are developing right now, the Prometheus, that, that they're all methane. Why? Well, methane doesn't require the low temperatures that hydrogen requires. Uh, and uh, it could be generated from clean sources. So it's not clean, I mean, burning methane clearly release CO2, but methane could be manufactured from carbon capture. So, oh, okay. so uh, if you are releasing uh, carbon, uh, carbon oxide uh, to, the, to the environment, but at the same time you are capturing it in the, at the same rate, the overall level will be maintained it will be yeah it would be like a net, net zero. zero yeah it's, it's the same concept as sustainable air fuels i mean it's just capturing it some somewhere and then compensating the release so having a a, a net zero emission and that's the that's what uh elon musk is planning actually there is a huge uh plan to a plan of producing about uh, 2, million, 2 million tons of hydrogen uh, every year, every year, yeah. And then uh, with a pipeline from, from uh, Texas to the coast, to, to Boca Chica, and then there using the hydrogen with, with, uh, carbon, with uh, carbon capture technology to generate methane in Boca Chica. Oh, okay. So there is a huge project involving that to make the Starship uh, fully clean, to make it carbon, well, carbon and, net zero. So, I mean, since we're talking about Starship again, do you think that 
that SpaceX will make it to Mars by 2030, as Gwen Shotwell, I think, recently predicted. I think she just updated her stats. And, and do you think NASA is ever going to make it back to the moon? Well, uh, 2030, they can be landing on Mars. Yes, they, they probably will. Uh, if it's not 2030, it's going to be 2031, 2032, but, you know, or, or even 2028. 20, I mean, but 2030 is, if, if they can continue <laughs> the development of the Starship at the same rate that they've been doing so far, and that will all depend on the FAA and the regulations and uh, uh, if, if, uh, if SpaceX can solve the 75 points that FAA complained in, in the report that they released uh, yesterday, uh, then probably they, they, they will. Uh, they don't have any reason of not doing it. Uh, I mean, the, the energy of sending a rocket to Mars is more or less the same energy you need to send it to the moon. Because uh, the the delta v, the, the 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 difference of speed a rocket needs to reach Mars is more or less the same that you need to 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 break and enter into the lunar orbit. So and and I think that it could be even easier. I mean, if they solve the problem of reentry and bre and atmospheric breaks that they need to do for for the recovery. Uh, for recovering it on, here on Earth, then they will apply something similar on, on Mars. The braking capability is going to be less on Mars because the, the atmosphere on Mars is not as dense as it is here on Earth. So it will provide less braking capabilities. But they just need to increase the area. I don't know how, but there are solutions for that. Inflatables or uh, parachutes or any other means other than or, or just use rocket the, the rocket to to break the same way they do with with uh with falcon 9 boosters they with falcon 9 boosters they don't use the aero braking that they are planning to do with with starship so i see it possible and probably well not crude landings by 2030 but for sure it's i i think feasible if that they will be landing things on mars by 2030 okay okay so probably not a human foot on mars but but some kind of robotic landing yes at least sending their payload that they will need to take off and then NASA is also, they, they've they kind of stalled out. I think they had a deadline of 2024 for the moon. And I, they're probably going to have to push that back. So I, I, I well, they, they most probably will have to push that back to 2026. Mm, I, 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 I don't see how in two years we could have safely, we, we could safely land on the moon and take off and go back because we don't have yet the gateway station ready. We don't have even the flight of the first unit. They're struggling with testing. And well, the, the cost of the runs uh, are killing NASA. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, with this, previously with the, with the James Webb Space Telescope that, <laughs> that it ended costing from, from 500 million to 10 billion. So that's 20 times cost <sighs> of a run. <laughs> and almost 10 years, no, almost 10 years of delay from 2011, that was the original launch uh, plan to 2021. And the, the, the moon rocket, well, uh, uh, it's a very complex thing and we are, talking about having the lunar uh, the, the lunar uh, starship because they will be landing with the with the lunar starship with them. and and if they cannot test it uh, to orbit and recover and you know 
uh, test all the different technologies that they need to deploy, it, I mean, to, to, to use it here on earth. <sighs> Doing that in two years is too much. I, I don't see us landing on the moon by 2024. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll I see 2026 we'll that... more realistic time frame. <laughs> what that that's not bad 2026 is only four years away so if they can pull it off in four years i think you know as a taxpayer i'll be happy but but that's yeah. just me so <laughs> well oscar thank you again so much for your time thank you again and you know as we mentioned i would love to have you back and cover some different topics as well but aerospace you have so much to offer and we covered so much territory in this interview so thank you very very much um let me let me close by asking what comes next for you what what are you working on currently and where is that going well uh my, my future my personal future is always related to te business and technology and that's it i have <laughs> one 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 uh, food on on technology i don't want to to be far from technology and the other food in, in business, because I think that technology is a nice place to be. It's very rewarding, but you cannot advance without the business point of view, because sadly, if, if we don't find a business case for all this technology, uh, it, uh, space exploration, uh, airborne, I mean, aviation exploration, materials exploration, and, and it's, it's all related. It's just driven by curiosity. But curiosity alone cannot bring the money necessary to explore those new grounds. So uh, as an explorer, uh, I, I'm realistic. I know that business is always required. So that's why I, I want to be there with technology but also uh, in the business related to, to those technologies. That's why yeah. I, I, I've always tried to, 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 to have uh, 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 food on, on both. That's why I, I have an MBA, but I'm also a master of science because uh, I, I think that both need each other. There is no business without technology. There is no technology without business. Yeah, no, I would, I would completely agree. And I think for me, at least the business helps to keep me grounded. So, okay. Well, Oscar, thank you again so much. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. It's been a pleasure and always an honor being here with you. Thank you. Have a great day, sir. You too.